When I was a kid, I used to dream about flying through space. Every week on TV, I'd watch my heroes jump into their rocket ships and took to the stars. And I wanted to be like them. They had courage, imagination, and no problem ever stood in their way for long. In the end, when we actually did send men into space, it turned out that those were exactly the qualities it took. I'm John Hudson. This is Pad 39 of the Kennedy Space Center. I was a launch controller here, when from this very spot, man took off to fly to the moon. It was a journey that began 12 years before that rocket ever left the ground. And it started on the other side of the world. Back then, we were one of two superpowers that always seemed to be on the edge of a terrible war. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched the first ever man-made satellite into Earth orbit. They called it Sputnik which means traveling companions. And the worlds for peace are in a delicate balance. It seemed to create a dangerous advantage. Every ham radio operator in the back could hear a beep. People were afraid. Were the Soviets looking down on us? Watching us? If they could make a satellite pass over our cities, could they do the same with a bomb? Our own space program kicked into high gear. And less than two months later, we were ready to launch our own satellite. It was being called the Space Race, and we were running a distant second. In 1961, we fell even further behind. Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man into space, circling the world in just 89 minutes. We had our own astronauts, and they were eager and ready to take the big ride. But our manned space program couldn't seem to get off the ground. We stuck with it, and on May 5th, 1961, things finally started going right. Astronaut Alan Shepard took his ship Freedom 7 six and a half miles into space. America had its first space hero. Just a few days later, our space program received a new challenge. But this one did not come from the Soviet Union. It came from our young president. In one inspiring moment, he changed the mission from one based in fear of the present to one of hope for the future. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Bryce play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We hadn't been more than 16 minutes into space, and now we were going to the moon. We would have to design a rocket the size of a 36-story office building, put it together with the precision of a microscope, and accelerate it to the speed of a bullet. Then we would have to guide it to a moving target 250,000 miles away. Many people thought it was an impossible dream, but 400,000 of us set about making that dream a reality. It would be the longest, the most hazardous voyage that any man had dared to attempt. But step by step, mission by mission, we orbited the Earth, perfecting the skills and technologies we would need on this incredible journey. Our astronauts practiced maneuvering, docking, and a thousand other tasks that would comprise the moon mission. We created new alloys, lighter and stronger than anything seen before. We designed communication systems that would be reliable over the vast distance. And behind it all, we tried to perfect the rocket that would be powerful enough to punch out of Earth orbit and take us to the moon.
One day, however, the dream of flying to the moon almost slipped away. It was January 27th, 1967. Astronauts Virgil Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chaffee were on board Apollo 1 for a plunge-up test, a full-scale dress rehearsal for the actual launch. Suddenly it happened. There was a fire in the gaps. Three men whose lives had been in our hands were lost. Surely the opening vistas of space promise high costs and hardships as well as high reward. But this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. After Apollo 1, some thought we'd fail and that the moon was out of our reach. But we owed it to those men to learn from their sacrifice and to carry on. We started taking the Apollo vehicle apart piece by piece. Was the design flawed? Had safety been compromised? Tough questions. And we spent one and a half years redesigning the spacecraft so that no astronaut's life would ever be at risk because we overlooked something or because we could have done something better. A moon rocket is 91% high explosive and it goes into the most unforgiving hazardous environment there is. We could never make it risk free. And the men who flew them knew that. We didn't send men into space again until Apollo 7 orbited the Earth testing some of the new design. When everything worked perfectly, the decision was made. The next mission would travel to the moon. It was mankind's destiny to leave the shores of our planet behind and strike out across the vast ocean of space. In the great span of our history, now was the time that we could. Now was the time that we would. We stood on the eve of the longest, most dangerous journey that any man had ever undertaken. And it would be taken by Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Andrews, the crew of Apollo 8. Through those doors, you'll find the firing room, launch control, just as it was on December 21st, 1968. Please gather all of your belongings. Take some old. This is the firing room. Launch control for the Apollo missions. This is not a mock-up. These are the very consoles we sat at when men first took off to fly to the moon. The tragedy of Apollo 1 put us a year and a half behind. We were making up for it in one big leap. And we were doing it with a rocket that no man had ever flown before. It was a few days before Christmas, 1968, when Apollo 8 sat on the panel. She was the first of a new kind, a moon rocket. This was the phoenix risen from the ashes of Apollo 1. The first Apollo crew did not die in vain. This was to be their testament. Thirty-six stories high, she had been fully fueled throughout the night. The liquid oxygen in her tanks caused ice to form on the outside of the craft. The extreme temperature differences between the air and the sub-zero fuel caused the metal skin of the rocket to expand and contract. Everyone was on the pad agreed. It was as though the rocket was alive, breathing, straining at the leash. Earlier in the morning, astronauts Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders had made their final preparations before taking that long ride out to the waiting spacecraft. The minimum safe distance from a Saturn V at liftoff was three miles. The reason was simple. When fully fueled, the rocket contained the explosive power of an atomic bomb. As the clock counted down, the astronauts and all of us in launch control went through the pre-flight checks, our hands on the controls of the most powerful, most complex machine ever built. 
It had over two million separate systems. And to bring these men back alive, everything had to work perfectly. Each individual system had been tested, but what we didn't know was how they would perform when all two million began to work together. That moment would come when the countdown clock reached zero. If a maneuvering thruster failed, if communications broke down, if navigation was off by one degree, if any piece of the miles of wiring, circuits, relays, or valves was defective, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders would pay with their lives. As they sat, waiting for the launch on that chill December morning, these three astronauts went back to what they had always been, test pilots. You are now in the final minutes before the launch of Apollo 8, right here where it actually happened. <coughs> Mankind is about to leave his planet behind and journey to another. It is one of those rare moments when history is not being made, destiny is being embraced. This is launch control, T minus three minutes and coming. We've completed our communications checks with the Apollo 8 astronauts in the cabin and the communications are go. During this period, once we do get the firing command, the various tanks within the three stages of the Saturn V launch vehicle begin to pressurize. We had firing command, the firing command is in, we are now on the automatic sequence, T minus two minutes, 20 seconds. Status board indicates that all aspects are ready, instrument unit is ready, spacecraft ready, final check of the emergency detection system, that ready light also on. First stage preparations are completed. Okay, you're on. All systems go. 10 minutes, 45 seconds and counting. The first stage of the oxygen tank has been pressurized and the pressure is still building up. Coming up on 90 seconds, Mark T minus 90 seconds and coming. The Apollo 8 uh, crew standing by, spacecraft commander Frank Warner, Jim Lover, Bill Andrews. We now have a report that the liquid hydrogen tank in the third stage is pressurized. 1 minute 15 seconds. Third stage propellants pressurized at this time as we come up on the 60 second mark on the flight to the moon. T minus 60 seconds and counting, the vehicle now is completely pressurized. We're coming up on a power transfer shortly. We have the power transfer, we're now on the flight batteries within the launch vehicle. Final reports coming from Frank Borman at this time. Final look at the switch list aboard the spacecraft. 20 seconds, all aspects, we are still remote at this time. T minus 15, 14, 13. 12, 11, 10, 9, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11
The engines are on. Four, three. Still the most powerful, the most complex machine ever built. And I guess it's the only one that can take you to another planet. I actually got to fly one on a second flight to the moon called uh, Apollo 13. But uh, that's another story. 